Hey everyone, this is Susan from BuzzSumo. Welcome to our session today. We're going to be talking all about measuring the ROI of your influencer marketing. Um, Shane is also here. Uh, he's ready to chat with you um, about his experiences with influencer marketing. Be great to know where everyone is logging in from. I'm in New Jersey, right outside New York City. Where are you, Shane? I keep forgetting. <laughs> I know. It's funny. So I'm, I'm between Sacramento and L.A. because I, I have my course I teach in UC, at, at UCLA. But right now I'm in Sacramento. Oh, cool. How long have you been teaching? So it's actually just just over a year. We mm -hmm. uh, UCLA reached out to me about doing the um, co-teaching the course that they have for influencer marketing. It's personal branding to influencer marketing. There's two pieces of it. One is for influencer marketing on the brand side. Hey, how to work with influencers. And the other side, how to be an influencer. So they figured LA would be a good spot, I guess, to find all the influencers and actors that now, you know, went from this and want to be influencers. That's cool. Yeah. So is there a lot, here's what I've always wondered. Is there a lot of overlap between uh, doing a webinar an online thing and teaching an actual class or are they completely two different animals? You know, it, there is some, there is some overlap, but it is kind of a different beast. I mean, um, the, the course that I, I fly down to LA once a week. So I go down there on, on Tuesday mornings, and I teach my class at night, 6.30 to 9.30, and then I come back on Wednesdays. Um, and putting the curriculum together is just, it has been, um, it's just a, a learning lesson, right? I mean, I've never, I've never been a teacher in that aspect. And since I, I put these webinars together and I put together, you know, my content and stuff, but I'm, I mean, it's three hours. I mean, the class is three hours. So it's wow. not like, uh, and, and as much as I'd like to think I'm, you know, somewhat cute and I'm somewhat entertaining and people might want to see my face, but nobody does for three hours. Like, I mean, just ask my wife, like she's seen it for 13 years and, and you know, every day I pray <laughs> you know, that, like, that she's going to stay with me. But, you know, at UCLA, it's like, I try to get, you know, I've had a lot of um, other speakers and stuff that mm -hmm. like Mark Schaefer was one of my guests that I had one time. And I've, mm -hmm. um, so the guys over at Lumanu that I have a good relationship with. So there's a number of people that I've had that, you know, I try to minim minimize the amount of, three hour time that I have with the students and we try to do some group activities and stuff. So mm -hmm. I've learned a lot through teaching the course. I mean, it's definitely, this is easy because it's one hour and it's great. We have great interaction and people ask, you know, they have great questions and stuff. But mm -hmm. when you have students in front of you and it's three hours, it's a, it's a little bit of a different beast. Yeah, it really is. I would think that, I mean, three hours is a huge amount of time. And I know that I did it. I went to college. I finished. I went to graduate school. But now the whole concept of three hours, it's just really, um, anyway, maybe that will be our question. So as we're getting started, everyone who's, um, who's here, uh, put down what is, the, what is the longest amount of time you can successfully pay attention to something to learn. So what I mean by this question is, if you're sitting down and you're going to learn something. Are you good for an hour? Are you good for two? Are you good for 17? Just drop it in the chat box and, um, and I don't know, we'll, we'll use it for some kind of research. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, I think <laughs> Another ahead. variable of that too is, is uh, maybe put your age next to it because you have to realize that the, the students that I'm working with, um, you know, are obviously they're 18 to let's say 20. I mean, there's sometimes there was, there was um, some students that are a little older. So the attention span isn't always, uh, always there. So, you know, especially in a three hour period of where you're trying to, you know, keep people intrigued and, and put out great content. So that's another factor as well, right? It's like trying to, you know, everybody has ADHD, not everybody has ADHD, but you know, you have these things of like, you got to stay in front of people and you got to entertain them and, and make sure they're enjoying the class and the content you're putting out. So it's definitely intriguing for sure. Yeah, I just put in one and a half hours. And that's if I can control all distractions, I can concentrate for a good hour and a half. I do think that sometimes if you have lots of commitments and things, you can get more distracted. So yeah. yeah. yeah oh, we've got someone saying one hour. Excellent. We're going to finish just in time for you, Igor. Yeah, Igor. <laughs> Anyone who's putting 45 minutes, we're going to be sad. Um, yeah. <laughs> Super. Well, it's the top of the hour, and uh, I know that people will be logging in for a few minutes. So while they're doing that, I'm just going to fill you in on a couple of things. Um, number one, I'm Susan Muller. I am the uh, director of marketing here at BuzzSumo. One of the favorite parts of my job for me is that I get to sit in on all these great sessions, learn from tons of people about their areas of both passion and expertise. It's uh, it's definitely a great thing to to get to hear all the super
deeper content. Now, if you are uh, curious, people always want to know, will there be a recording? Yes, there will be a recording and we will send it to you. Typically, that will be about a day after the session, so you can expect to get the recording by tomorrow. Um, so don't, don't worry, we will send that to you. We would love to take questions. Uh, Shane has volunteered to take any questions that you have about the topic. There are two ways to make that happen. The first is that you can put your questions in the chat box. You can also put them in the Q&A section of the webinar software. So yes, there will be a recording and yes, please ask questions. For the most part, we're gonna refer the questions to the end and, uh, and get those answers then. But if it's something absolutely pressing, I will uh, jump in and ask Shane during the session. All right, so that should cover all of the uh, all of uh, all of the housekeeping details, if you will. Um, let me introduce Shane Barker. Shane is a digital strategist and an influencer marketing specialist. He's been published at some great places like Inc, Forbes, and Entrepreneur. As I was thinking about what type of webinar would be beneficial for our customers, I was uh, drawn to some things that Shane has written about influencer marketing and specifically uh, he he wrote a post not too wrong excuse me he were <laughs> he wrote a post not too long ago where he said if you plan and implement your influencer marketing effectively it can produce a sizable ROI typically the ROI you'll see from one dollar invested in influencer marketing is six dollars and fifty cents so I, I love that he's thinking about influencer marketing thinking about how to measure it and has some hard numbers on on what works and what you can expect in terms of ROI. Thanks so much, Shane, for being with us. Can't wait to hear what you have to say. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really excited about uh, chatting with everybody today about influencer marketing. You're welcome. So cool. Let me go ahead and get my screen going here. Let me know when you guys can see my screen. All right, so you guys, so this one's again, super excited about this. Thank you to Buzz Sumo and Susan for having me here today. Um, you know, what we're gonna go over today is really how to calculate the ROI of influencer marketing. Um, I am Shane Barker, digital strategist, uh, branded influencer consultant. Um, I have two companies, well, actually I have a number of companies, but the two that we're gonna talk about today is Shane Barker Consulting, so it's shanebarker.com. And I'm also the founder of Content Solutions where we do, um, you know, brand mentions and we do content for clients as well. Today's the 26th, that's 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, and uh, let's get into this. So let's, I'm gonna lay a little foundation for you guys, like who is Shane Barker? I've already kind of told you my title. Uh, my day job, I'm a digital marketing consultant who specializes in influencer marketing, uh, product launches, sales funnels, targeted traffic, uh, and website conversions. You know, I've worked with, you know, Fortune 500 companies, influencers with digital products, and a number of, uh, of A-list celebrities. So that is, I've been doing, I've been in the digital space for 20 something years. Um, I know you guys are looking at my, my, this little baby face and I use oil valet. So that's probably the reason why you guys, uh, thank God he looks so young. Or maybe I started when I was seven years old, which, uh, if maybe at the bonus, I'll tell you how old I am at the end. So you guys can, you know, once again, you guys can tell me if I really look that old. Um, but my night job, we kind of touched on it a little earlier. I'm actually an instructor I, uh, at UCLA. I teach a course called personal branding uh, and influencer marketing. There's two sides of the course. One is for um, brands that want to work with influencers. And the other one is you, if you want to become an influencer um, and how to go about that. So we have um, the courses. It's a, um, it's a pretty long course. So it's about a 12, 13 week course um, that we do there. And I teach that with Amanda, who is a co-instructor as well. Um, all right, so where have I been mentioned? So New York Post, Forbes, Mexico, USA Today, Entrepreneur Vice, ABC News. There's a number of places that I've been mentioned. The reason I'm bringing this up is um, I've been in the space for about six years. Um, I've, I speak at all the big events. I'm in the influ Influencer Marketing Days, Influencer Marketing Hub events um, in Mexico as part of the first influencer um, big conference they had out there. I was one of the keynote speakers. So I've been around a little while when it comes to the influencer space, um, and we'll kind of touch on that a little later. So um, who I write for, um, Susan uh, brought some of this up. I'm in Inc. Forbes, Huffington Post, Social Media Examiner, um, Buzz Sumo, obviously, um, Salesforce, there's hundreds of other websites as well. And one a proud moment for myself was I was named uh, one of the 100 influential people in influential marketing. Um, some of these people you might recognize, Kim Kardashian. Um, if you don't know who she is, then just go Google her and just don't go click on images right away if you're at work. Uh, Gary V, obviously very familiar, Richard Elderman, um, and then myself. So what are we going to talk about today? So um, one of the things that we talk about when it comes to influencer marketing, one of the ways I like to lay a foundation is 
One of the things you have to realize when it comes to influencer marketing is influencer marketing is no different than SEO, than PPC or anything like that. We've got a little bit of backlash in the media recently about fake uh, followers and some other stuff. Um, one of the things you have to realize is that when you're doing influencer marketing, that if you don't do it correctly, it is not going to work. If you don't do SEO correctly, it will not work. If you don't do PPC correctly, it is not going to work. So if you, if you did a campaign and it was unsuccessful, um, which a lot of my clients are the ones that have already tried it once and then you know, say, hey, and then I'll have to review their campaign and see what they did wrong. But if you don't find the right influencers, it's not going to make any money. If you don't have the right product, if you're not going after the right people, if you don't have the right pitches, if you don't you know, have these types of things, um, it's not going to be successful. And so Susan touched on, you know, campaigns that we've done where, you know, you chip in, you put in $1 and you made $6 and 50 cents. We have other campaigns that you've put in $1, they made $2. We've had campaigns that haven't been successful in the beginning when we started this. So um, it's not the end all be all. It's not something you need to put all of your ad budget into and just do throw a Hail Mary. But if done correctly, it can be, can have huge, huge successes and, and once again, great things can happen. Um, so what we'll talk about is what do you need to calculate the ROI? Um, how do you cal calculate ROI, the qualitative analysis, and then how do you calculate ROI from a, a quantitative analysis? So there's two different sides to this. Um, so what is it important to measure ROI? Um, no measure of ROI, um, if you have no measure of ROI equals inefficient use of budget and resources, and then obviously inefficient use of budget resources equals a failed campaign, right? So once again, you have to set these things up ahead of time. We talk about ROI, um, and we'll talk about little KPIs as well here. Um, but measuring ROI isn't that simple, right? So it's not um, something that's just, it, this is why we're going through this today, right? This is the reason why you guys signed up for the webinar. So right now about 76% of marketers find it difficult to measure ROI in influencer marketing campaigns. Um, and then there's some other things that they have issues with, but the big thing being ROI. Um, so what is the difference or, or why is it difficult to measure the ROI of influencer marketing? So, you know, the goal of influencer marketing is really to invoke emotions or uh, actions by building relationships with your target audience. So one of the things we talk about with this, we're talking about qualitative and quantitative, but um, how do you measure a relationship? And Gary Vee had a funny little saying, like, how do you measure, uh, or, or how, do you, how do you measure the ROI of your mother, right? Because that's a relationship that you have. So it becomes a little difficult. So we're gonna go through that. Like I said, we're gonna go through both sides of this. Um, but what do you need to calculate ROI? You need to have goals and KPIs, right? So if you don't have a goal in mind, um, once again, I'm gonna use a, if I'm gonna go on a marathon, right? I'm gonna run a marathon. If I don't know that the end is 26.2 miles, then I just go, right? I don't, I don't have that goal of, or a time of two hours, that's my goal. You need to set these up ahead of time. And the same thing with the campaign. What do you want your goals to be? What are your KPIs gonna be, right? Those are gonna be really, really important in this. So goal, heading, goal um, setting helps to answer the questions like, did my influencer marketing campaign work? Should we try a different type of influencer? Um, what, uh, what about a different type, what a different medium? And then do we need to change up the content? So these are all things, once again, these are all variables that we have to look at with a campaign. Just because you've gone on Instagram and you've worked with five influencers and the campaign didn't work doesn't mean that Instagram doesn't work. Doesn't mean that you can't have other influencers that potentially can work. You really have to take a look at it. You have to realize there's millions of potential influencers on Instagram. There's millions of potential people or, or YouTubers on YouTube, right? So if you work with one, doesn't mean that the other ones aren't gonna work, but you have to make an analysis of this. No different if I did a PPC campaign and I went after some kind of a target audience, if that didn't work, that doesn't mean PPC doesn't work, that just means that target audience probably isn't the right audience. So you have to drill down a little deeper. So the characteristics of every goal should be what we call these the SMART, right? Which is specific, measurable, um, achievable, uh, results oriented, and time bound, right? So these are all things you have to think about when you're setting your goals for your influencer campaigns. Um, so influencer marketing goals examples, some of this, some of the things that you can, that you want to, you can measure is boosting brand awareness. Um, you can generate sales or conversions. You can tap into a, a new target market. Um, you can grow your social media followers and then you can use influencer content as um, testimonials and social proof, which is um, something that we, you know, something you want to negotiate in your contract with your influencers that if you're doing a campaign together, that all that content that your company can use that for other things, testimonial, social proof, that kind of thing. Cause you want to have those campaigns be not only good when they go live, but you want to be able to reuse that, repurpose that content over time. So the most popular influencer marketing KPIs, I would say engagement, right? That's one thing to look at reach, um, impressions, followers, referral traffic, and then sales and conversions. So how do you measure the ROI of influencer marketing, right? So you got to think about your goals um, and you have to compare your progress um, against your previous um, decided KPI. So 
you know, you go, okay, today we were actually, you know, this is what we're looking to get. We were looking to get whatever, $1,000 in sales, $10,000 in sales. So we measure that against your next campaign and see like, hey, did we, what were the results like, right? And these can all be different. It doesn't have to be sales driven, but, and if you don't have any, if this is your, your first time doing it, you don't have any KPIs, then you have to figure out what you think is going to be realistic. So that's one of the questions I ask when I talk to my clients or potential clients. It's like, hey, what are you looking to do? If they say, hey, we're looking to spend $1,000, but we want to get, you know, $500,000 in sales, that's probably not too realistic, right? Unless you have some crazy patented product that, you know, you can have kids fly or something, I don't know, something crazy, then that would make sense potentially. But you, you have to look at those. You have to have to set those proper expectations. I see a lot of that with influencer and brands um, because it's still, influencer marketing is still new that when they talk about things, they don't really talk about things. It's like, hey, let's start a relationship, but let's not figure out if we both want to have kids in five years or something, right? So it's, there's certain things you got to kind of talk about ahead of time to just see if it makes sense, if it's going to, you know, so once again, you guys can have those that have measurable success from that. But you have to remember effective measurement equals qualitative and quantitative analysis. Um, and we'll go into the different things right now. So with quality, from the qualitative side of things, um, the dictionary says qualitative analysis um, is a use of non-quantifiable methods to evaluate investments or business opportunities and make decisions. So the idea of this is that you're going to, you know, there's going to be some type of investment or some kind of business opportunity and you have to make an educated decision from that. So um, qualitative influencer marketing results can be sediment and it can also be brand awareness for the two things we'll talk about today. Um, so sediment, like how do you measure that? So um, one thing you want to do is you can, obviously there's softwares, which we'll talk about that, but it's being one of them. Um, you actually go through the comments and you look on influencers posts and look for brand mentions on social media. So that's a, a, a very, um, it's time intensive, right? To be able to do that. But it's important that, you know, we use softwares to go find influencers and, or to go find sediment or find how popular a post is. Obviously, BuzzSumo, we use that for content to be able to see how many shares and, and that kind of stuff has been, we've been have huge successes with that. And so those softwares are where you want to go check that out. But also you, if you find an influencer, you find a piece of content. It's also important to go take a look at that piece of content and take a look at the comments, right? Because it could be extremely popular, but for all the wrong reasons. So software is phenomenal, but you also want to kind of dig a little deeper once you figure out either A, the kind of content you want to put together, or in this example, the type of influencers you want to use. So what to look for, the nature of the comments and the mentions, right? That's, I was just kind of touching on that a little bit. Um, some good examples are their positive expressions of love for your brand or, or the products that they've worked with in the past or the influencer, or they are the people expressing frustration with their products or service or the content they put out there. So, you know, this is the world of, of social media, right? So you can either put something out and it's super epic and everybody loves it and it goes viral or something awesome happens, or it can also go viral because of something bad, right? And we'll go over some of those examples. Um, there's certain things you want to do to, to make sure you're putting out good content, you're authentic in your content, but that's not a guarantee that there might not be some backlash. So it's something to think about. So this is one of a, a positive sentiment, right? So this is, um, this is Julia. So when she's just talking about like, Hey, this is what she's been going through. She has some meds that she was taking for some things that she had that was going on a pretty authentic post, right? Because she had some ailments that were, were going on and she's very authentic in, in the sense that she's talking about, Hey, I work out, but I also have these certain issues, right? I'm not perfect. I'm not a perfect influencer. Like people like to be sometimes think that they need to set up this image of being perfect. So this is a very authentic post of things that she's taking to help her work out or stay motivated or lose weight or something like that. Um, but once again, good, a good example, but this sediment is positive. Then you take a look at the comments, love this post. I have to admit, I've never really read long descriptions of pictures, but this time I did and I sat and I read and it was amazing, right? So that's a good sentiment. So you want to look at those comments because there could be a thousand comments if they're all bad or if there are a thousand people just writing emojis, something a little suspect out of that. Though. This is engaging content because people are engaging with it. So negative sentiment. So, so Scarlett, sorry for doing this, but we, we look at a situation here where um, she was First of all, she, this is, she's trying to portray this as this is how she wakes up, right? She wakes up with, you know, 14 balloons uh, with a sign that says good morning. Um, and she also wakes up with her coffee. She's, you know, makeup's perfect. Um, probably not the life that anybody that, that I live. I mean, my wife's absolutely beautiful, but she does not wake up like this um, with cherries and strawberries and, you know, the, the balloons and everything. Now, if it was her birthday, maybe. Um, and so the issue is, is that her audience felt like this was very... Un, wasn't authentic. And the other issue is, is the other thing, if you look down here on the bottom, is that it looks like those are supposed to be pancakes with the strawberries on top. Those are actually tortillas. And so what happened was, is the audience gave her a really bad time or her, her followers gave her a bad time for 
trying to make it seem like this is her life when it's not. It's very not authentic. But the fact that she put tortillas down and claimed that they were they were pancakes when they weren't. So, anyways, my point of this is like people look at this and you start to lose your following because it's just that's not the way that people live and it just doesn't feel natural. So um, brand awareness, like how to measure, look for brand mentions on social media, as we already kind of talked about, look at the nature of those mentions. Um, and then do people talk about your brand or, or products positively? And then does your brand name come up in discussions about problems um, your, your products can solve? So that's another thing you want to look at. If the comments are really important, like I said, in looking at that and making those, those types of evaluations. Uh, and then how to check brand mentions easily. Obviously, we talked about, touched on this a little bit. I'm going to give you guys some great examples right now is using social listening tools or platforms. Obviously, BuzzSumo is the one that we highly recommend, not just because we're doing the webinar with them, but literally it's the one that we use all the time um, because you can, for content, for content ideas. I mean, I go and look because we do a lot of content creation for my clients. I want to know what kind of content is, has done, has had good reviews or had a lot of shares. So it's very easy to go into BuzzSumo and be able to look at that. Obviously, you can look at influencers as well. There's a lot of great tools to that. Uh, Mention.com also has some good features as well, and Social Bakers does some good stuff. If you're looking at um, when people put up a post, the analytics on specific posts, which is very interesting for us. Um, but all great tools, once again, all highly recommended. Um, so BuzzSumo, this is some stuff that we take a look at. Um, you know, the, the amount of mentions that you get, the amount of mentions that have happened in the last seven days, the last 30 days. Um, and you can do comparisons. Obviously, you can do it under brands. You can look up um, your keywords, your backlinks. I mean, there's so many things that you guys can do. You can do with BuzzSumo. It's not just a tool just for social to look at the, the, you know, your ups and downs. There's a lot of other things and uh, features that, that, that we highly recommend that we use, once again, for our clients. Um, here goes a great one I touched on a little bit earlier. Talks about types of content, right, and where that content um, is being shared and how long ago it was put up and then how many social shares it's, it's received. Um, this was one, obviously, that only been, this, this content only been up for 14 minutes, so it didn't get a lot of social shares at that point, but I'm sure at this point, because this, the content that Steve puts out is phenomenal, probably got a lot of shares at that point. Um, also, another thing you can do is you can also set up alerts. Um, um, that's an inexpensive way of doing it as well. Google Alerts is really easy to set up. You can go and say, hey, for my own brand name, Shane Barker, for my name, for my own company name, for my competitor's name, and you can get sent these updates. One of the things I love about uh, BuzzSumo is that I, I look up like, like influencer marketing and they'll send me an update of all the contents and post it about that and I can go and review it really easily. Instead of going and Google searching it and that kind of stuff, I get a curated list that comes to me, which is awesome. Um, so how do you calculate ROI from a quantitative analysis, right? So um, the definition of this is going to be uh, quantitative analysis is a use of math and statistical methods um, to evaluate investment or business opportunities and make decisions. So qualitative is more like visual kind of what you're seeing, like the sediment, that kind of thing. This is going to be more from a math and a statistical methods, right? So more of like numbers. Um, and so one of the things we look at with this is, um, obviously brand awareness, sales and conversions, and then the social media reach as well. Brand awareness and then how we measure it. So reach engagement and impressions are what we look at. Um, and then when you talk about awareness, like what do we look for? How many times was an influencer post shared? Um, what was the engagement rate on that post? And then one other thing that we do, and there's also other ways, there's other softwares you can use, but ask influencers to share their analytics reports. Um, you know, just to kind of see A, if it's a, you're selling a product that's a and maybe only a certain location on a brick and mortar location, or if you're going to looking to launch this product in you know, the United States or in Los Angeles or in Brazil or something like that, those analytics are important because the insight behind that is going to kind of tell you whether this is the right audience for you or not. Um, another thing to be careful of is when you're looking at influencers, don't just go after influencers with large followings. Um, that's a, a common mistake. And one of the reasons why we have potential issues with fake followers is because people were setting these price points on the amount of followers they have. So if you say, Shane, I'll give you $1,000 for 10,000 followers, but I'll give you $15,000 for a million followers, and that might be a big discrepancy, but you get my point, then there's the potential of people wanting to get to that next mark, not from an organic standpoint, but from a point of being able to get fake followers so they can get to that next price point, which is a lot more money. So it's just something to be careful of. Take a look at it. You can, you know, I would much rather have somebody that has 5,000 heavily engaged followers than 500,000 not engaged followers. It's just you, there's something to take a look at. It's more about the quality than the quantity. Um, so here goes insights. Some of the things you guys can look at is like, you know, the followers, the reach, impressions. These are all things that are that that only the the influencer can see. Um, and then how do you get easy access to sponsored content? Um, analytics. So you can ask the influencer to use uh, on Facebook. They have branded content um, or Instagram has branded content. So when you do that, so let's say you do content together on on Facebook 
Um, the cool part about it is you can actually, the influencer can tag the partner brand, right? So I'm tagged, whatever it is, tag watches or whatever this may be, Rolex or something. And the uh, brand and influencers both can view the performance, right? So that's what's awesome. So on Facebook, I can see it as brand or as an influencer, but also the brand can see it as well. And you guys can share those analytics. So you're not having to share all of your analytics with the brand if you don't want to. Um, both of them can run ads to amplify content reach. Um, and there's some value in that as well. So this is an example, Style Now Feed in uh, Jasper's Market. So what this was, was where they did a collaboration. We have an influencer and you have a brand. Um, and now you, they both can run paid ads towards it, but they also can see the analytics on it as well. So Instagram's a little bit of a different beast. So Instagram is branded content, but influencers can tag partner brands in their sponsored posts. But branded influencers both can view the performance analytics, but brands cannot run ads on branded content. So only the influencer can do that and have access to that. So it's a little bit of a different deal. Um, still, there's some value in it. Um, and once again, from, you know, I'll, I'll speak on the FTC's uh, um, standpoint here. Make sure you're, you're, you're putting in there if, you're, if it's some type of a sponsored content, if you've received some kind of compensation, whether it's free product, whether it's money, whether it's anything like that. So make sure you're using your hashtags or make sure you're claiming that as well. Um, just to be authentic with those. Um, so here goes a good example. So this was uh, one by Jared. Jared put this together. And he had a, is a paid partnership with Star Wars movies. And so obviously he's him and the kids and all the fun stuff with solo cups and all that. Um, and it was, once again, a good piece of content. Kind of showed him having fun with the kids. And, you know, I mean, who doesn't love a good Star Wars movie? Um, but this was a piece of content they put together on, on Instagram. Um, and I think it was the, um, uh, Jared was the one that ran the ads behind it. All right. Let's see. Ooh, let's see. Um, and then sales and conversions, like how to measure it. So clicks, conversion rates, revenue, and then referral traffic. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do this. I mean, one of the, the easier ways to do it is some type of an affiliate program where you have a link that you give to an influencer um, and then they can, they can go and put it out there. But one thing you have to remember, um, influencer marketing has changed. And when, we, when I first started doing it five or six years ago, and seven years ago, um, it's not just putting out that link once and praying, you know, putting up an ad or putting up a, a post and then assuming that you're going to get $10,000 in sales, right? It's going to be a frequency deal. You, it's not just a one-time deal. Like me, when I drive past a, you know, a sign or something, you have to see that sign, what, seven times, or there's has to be seven things that happen for you to be able to make that buying decision. So influencer marketing is no different. If you just put up one post with Kim Kardashian, don't expect to make millions of dollars from that, right? It's, that's not the way that it is. It's a frequency deal. People need to see it over and over and over and feel like this is a brand that you really are vouching for. And so one post usually isn't going to do that for you. Um, so sales or conversions, what to look for, how many people clicked on the affiliate links, obviously, right? How much revenue is generated from this? How many people use these unique discount codes? We'll, we'll talk about that in a second um, of an influencer to buy. And then how much revenue was generated from this? And then how many people came to the website after seeing an influencer's post? Um, all these things, if you have unique affiliate links and then you'll know who drove the most traffic, um, you know, you're working with 10 different people and you have 10 affiliate links and let's say you're doing three posts or three stories or whatever that, that, you know, or three things on YouTube. What you want to do is make sure you understand that you're looking at the end of that, like who drove the most traffic and who drove the most sales. Um, cause you want to know who's doing that, right? I mean, obviously if I have eight people that aren't doing good and I have two people that are doing phenomenal. I'd like to move that budget from them and move it to the other people. Okay. Hold on here. My all right. My screen just froze up on me, I think, here. Uh, I think it might have froze up on me one second. Sorry about this. Okay, let me do this. Do you want me to pull up my set? Yeah, let me see here. It's just, it looks okay. like it just froze up. All right, let me see here. Several people joined in while you're working on that um, after we started. If you have questions uh, during Shane's presentation, please feel free to drop them into the chat box. We'll circle back to those at the end of the presentation. Um, so if you have anything you wanna ask Shane, please um, please feel free to, to go ahead and drop those questions in there. And another thing that I'm interested to know from our audience is how many of you are actively using influencer marketing marketing right now. If you wouldn't mind to go ahead and put that into the chat box, I think that would be really interesting to know if you are or are not using influencer marketing right now. So go ahead and put that into the chat box. And what we can do too here, let's pull up, and Susan, let's pull up yours because for some reason mine is, it froze up on me. So let's see. Mine. And we can answer. 
Yeah, let's do that. And what we can do is we can answer some questions too as we go through this. Super. Yeah, I have a question for you. Um, yeah. on, on this screen, um, you were talking about affiliate links and revenue. So how, how do you actually, if you're a beginner at this, how do you actually measure that revenue? Um, do you go from the link numbers? And then the second question is, do you have... Um, do you have to have an affiliate link structure or is there something else that you can do to measure that impact? Yeah. So there's a, there's actually softwares. I mean, there's the old school affiliate programs, right. That can work mm -hmm. as well, but there's a lot of really cool e-commerce um, companies that are actually really playing on this because mm -hmm. it's really nice to be able to go onto Instagram. If you see something, an outfit or something that somebody's wearing mm -hmm. that you can actually click on the link in the bio and it'll take you to a page that will show those exact same products in that same picture. And then you can click on it and there's some type of an affiliate relationship. But that way, if you have somebody that's a, that's a, you know, stylistic person or somebody that has a lot of style and you always like their stuff, you go, oh, I wonder where they get that dress or they get that suit or they get that, you know, outfit or those shoes. Um, it's very easy to go and click on that. And once again, kind of be able to go from there and, and be able to, to see that product and, and see where they purchase it at. And then you can go take a look at it. Mm hmm Cool. I have, um, I have my screen ready to go. So right. let me see. I'm going to stop your share. Good enough. Perfect. Yeah, and awesome. there you go. Uh, let's see. Can you see my screen? Hello, people. Resume share. There we go. There we go. Yeah. So let me uh, just scroll through. Yeah. Trying to get Sorry it to the right that. spot. Yeah, yeah. Can um can everyone confirm that you can actually see um see the screen? Looks like we've got some people in. Is that the right the right one? So I think it is going to what number are we in? And then let's see. Yeah, I think that's okay, it. Okay, I got it. Okay, super. Yeah. We're back on track. Hooray! All right, there we go. So let's go and click <laughs> to the next one. The next one. Got yes, it. I think that was which one? There we go. So here goes an example. So. This is somebody who talks about slow mornings and good reads for my favorite. Also loving my wave ring, right? So this is the Pura, Pura Vita has obviously built their brand off of, um, off of influencer marketing. That was really how they, they um, actually became extremely famous and made millions of dollars from it. I just was reading some stuff on Shopify about this. But um, you'll see here that they actually have a code in there. It's, this one's a, a Alex Davies 20. So that's how they keep track of it. So they know when you, you, know, when you click on the website, it'll actually you can go in there and put, hey, put in this um, specific code. Uh, specific to this influencer and then you can see what kind of sales are being driven from there um, not all influencers are going to want to use um, codes and stuff um, but i think some of them will i mean once again everything is negotiable when it comes to influencers so not everybody is going to um agree maybe not won't agree to one thing but maybe we'll be better on another thing so once again it's everything's negotiable just remember that that not all influencers are under one bucket so some people will work in this manner some people don't want pay but say hey listen i would like to just receive free products some people will say no to free product but once again, everything is negotiable when it comes to these things when working with influencers and brands. So once again, we talked about, you know, how to track conversions. So unique um, coupon codes like we saw there with um, the bracelets, unique um, affiliate links, and then tracking pixels is another thing for the remarketing of things. So we're going to, um, I think, go back one more for me here. There we go. So um, social media reach, how to measure it. So follower count. So obviously, if you have an increase in your follower count, then you're going to know that things will work. But once again, you want to figure out where it start, you know, figure out your, your today numbers. And then obviously, you know, if it goes up in, in numbers and obviously if that's a, a KPI for you, then that can be a success as well. So the growth of your followers, kind of just touched on that a little bit as well. So how to do the uh, quantitative analysis. So um, BuzzSumo, obviously, Grin is another one that we use for influencers. Um, and then Group High has a good database as well. When we talk about, you know, influencers and looking at the uh, quantitative side of things. So the key takeaways um, is the ROI of influencer marketing is difficult to calculate, but not impossible. What I mean by that is there's two sides that you want to take a look at, right? So um, sales being one side, but then also the, the other side of it, the qualitative and quantitative being, you know, you want to take a, a, an equal evaluation of both of those. Um, if you don't have any goals and you have no ROI, right? Um, define your smart goals, right? You want to make sure if you're a brand, you want to make sure you're coming to um, the influencer and saying, hey, this is what we're looking for. Have a brief together as well. So the brief's going to be extremely important. In a brief, you want to 
kind of say, hey, these are the hashtags we use. This is content we've seen that's been successful in the past. Doesn't mean the content needs to be exactly like that, but at least giving them a little bit of some ideas of what they need to do, when the content needs to be produced, how many pieces are being produced, how much money, the compensation, all that kind of stuff. And that will kind of help, you know, once again, streamline the, the relationships, so you guys know where everything's at, so you don't have, there's no questions. And then effective ROI measurement equals, once again, qualitative plus quantitative analysis. Um, and I think the last slide is questions. Excellent. Cool. Um, Shane, thank you so much. That was really very helpful. Um, let me check the chat box and see. It doesn't look like we have too many questions right now, um, but there are a couple that I think I've heard quite frequently. And one of those is, is there, you mentioned Instagram and Facebook. Do you think that there's room for influencer marketing on lots of different networks or is it just those two? I think that kind of um, points into a second area, which is um, as far as B2B examples of influencer marketing, do you have any of those as well? Yeah, so I think it's, you know, we talk about influencer marketing. I, I think any platform has the potential. I mean, we've found the most success on Instagram mm -hmm. and YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, there, there can be some, I mean, there's there, on Twitter, there can be some, there's not too many, I mean, Twitter influencers, I'm, I'm more, I would say I'm more popular on Twitter than I am any other platform. Mm -hmm. And we, there's just not a lot of, I mean, there, there can be some, but it's, that's not where most people spend their time. Most of the time it's on Instagram because it's a lifestyle type thing. And it's really easy for brands. That's why the Pro V, the bracelet did really well. And that's why people kind of see that lifestyle type stuff. And YouTube is, can be really successful as well because, you know, once again, YouTube being the, you know, second largest search engine. So mm -hmm. when you have people that are, you know, reviewing products or talking about products, you know, the, the place or, or wanting to know about something, you know, they're going to researching something, YouTube can be big. So if you have influencers on there that are talking about your product or um, a lot of the stuff, the keyword driven stuff that can be done there is really interesting. But then B2B, uh, B2B can be, um, you know, when you talk about brand mentions, you talk about, you know, um, influencers that where you work with that mention you on, you know, let's say big authoritative websites or um, talk, you know, do reviews of, of, of your product or your service on their website. Um, all that stuff can be obviously extremely valuable. It really comes down to what kind of a product or service do you have? Mm -hmm. And where do you think the most bang for your buck is going to be, right? And where do you think your followers or what do you think your, your perfect buyer persona, where are they going to be hanging out at, mm -hmm. right? So that's always the question at the end of the day, because people go, where, where should I start? And I've had products where we've said, hey, I think Instagram is a place to start. And we've done, you know, 15, 20 campaigns and it's done, you know, not bad. And mm -hmm. we're like, well, let's try YouTube. And then all of a sudden we go to YouTube and we have one YouTube star or you, maybe somebody's not even a crazy YouTube star that mm -hmm. just, once again, right type of content for the right audience and it just goes crazy. So, you know, everything is like anything else, everything you want to test and, and see where you're at and, and be able to learn. And you don't, when I say test, you don't have to spend, you know, $100,000 to go test something. Um, it's if you want to put a little more time into it, which I recommend before you start putting a big budget behind it, then what you want to do is you want to go in and test those kind of things. And, and like I said, see where you're at and see what kind of results have happened from it and whether, you know, it's good or bad in the sediment and that kind of thing. That's great. Um, thanks. Yeah. So uh, a couple questions. One um, is from Bertrand who's asking, can you touch on YouTube gaming influencers? Yeah, I mean, that's a hot one. Like, well, gaming and then there's also Twitch and there's a lot of, you know, pretty crazy platforms out there where there's, um, once again, gaming is huge, right? I mean, that's, you have people that will literally just watch people play video games and will tip them, right? They'll give them a dollar, two dollars, five dollars, um, hoping to be mentioned on there. I mean, there's, there's influencers that are making hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. Now, mm -hmm. with that being said, and it's, it's one of the things that I've always talked about when I talk about my clients of uh, influencers and I have both sides, clients of influencers and brands, but when you're an influencer, one of the things you got to be careful of, and I know this is, you know, this is going to be, everybody's going to say cry me a river is that, you know, the gaming side of things I was reading about one of the guys, I think it was on Twitch, I believe, but he was talking about, you know, he makes $500,000 a month. And so, you know, nobody's really, you know, nobody wants, nobody, nobody's sad when he said this, but what he said was like, you know, Hey, I, I had to take a day off and I lost 40,000 followers. Right. So the, it's, <laughs> Right. And so everybody was like, oh, crap. Happens to like, everyone. Right. I know. I'm like, I wish I had 40,000 to give away like that. But what, but for, for him, what it was, was, and I, I tell my influencers, this is like, you know, influence, being an influencer is not easy. Um, a lot of people think it's like, hey, I just go get on a jet and, you know, I get my, whatever, my latte and I have my little fruity dog and I've got my, you know, you know everything's gold and platinum. And I'm like, you know, it's, it's a lot of work, right? But to produce that kind of content. And, it's not an overnight thing. And I think one of the things you have to realize is that if you're not performing, like if you're not out there putting out epic content, then they're going to move on to somebody else. And the gaming community, as an example, like this guy took, I think it was, a, I think it was a day off, maybe two days. 
And he's like, I lost all kinds of followers because he wasn't performing. Right. So you, you have to remember these influencers, they're people too. Right. And they're, they're, I'm not saying, you know, you know, cry me a river. Cause he's not, he, you know, he only made 400,000 instead of 500,000, which I think he probably made enough that month. I'm pretty sure he'll be able to feed his family on 400,000 in one month. Um, but the idea being is, is like, you know, it's, you just have to continue to perform and gaming. The gaming side of things is always interesting. Once again, that, that community is, is gonna, it's going to continue to grow. Obviously like with the, um, what was it the, um, how oh, was it called? You know, esports. There's some other ways. So oh, there's yeah. a <laughs> yeah, I know I mean, what you mean. Huge, huge, huge industry there. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, so here's another question. Um, this one's from Rick. He's asking, would you still recommend branded content, even if it could possibly lessen your conversion rate? So here's the deal is, and, and we haven't seen, you know, that if it's brand, so here's the deal. I know that people sometimes go, Hey, branded content, then it kind of takes away like a little bit of the, the sizzle and the steak, right? Because it's like, now you're admitting to the, to being partners. I mean, from the FTC's, FTC's perspective, you're supposed to say that that's it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I recommend that just because if you, you want to make sure you're above the law with this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is, is when it comes to that type of, you can, I mean, this is the thing, you can still do branded content and still have great results because it really comes down to the frequency type side of things. If you're just doing one post, I don't care if it's branded or not branded, it's not going to work. I mean, it's mm -hmm. a frequency deal. I mean, the way I, the way I look at when I work with influencers, I'm looking for the long term. You know, mm -hmm. I want the brand should be looking for the long term too. You're looking for somebody that's going to be around for three, six months, a year, two years, five years, 10 years, because it's, you know, it's no different than think of like a, a, um, you know, if I'm a recording studio and I go to pick up Justin Bieber, I go pick up a new artist. Like they're looking for the long term. They want you mm -hmm. to continue to make records, right? It's not a, Hey, let's just go do one record and then let's get you out of here. Cause it's a lot to be able to promote and put people in that position. So you want to find the right influencers. So the goal of this is to go long term, right? So whether it's branded or not branded, the idea is, is you want it to be a longer term relationship and more of a frequency based thing. Like it's, it's also, if I'm an influencer and I'm talking about 10 different shoes from 10 different companies in five different months, that looks bad on my side as well. Cause it's like, okay, if you did this campaign with Adidas, why wouldn't they stick with you? Right. I'm kind of confused. It just shows like, it's like, it's like the, the guy or girl that if, if I was, you know, I'm happily married for 13 years, but if I was, you know, if I dated five women in two months, like you're like, there's probably something wrong with Shane. They just keep dating. He can't seem to find anybody. Right. And so it's kind of the same thing. Like you do want to have consistency with the brands that you work with. And you want that long-term relationship. There is, there's, there's more value in that down the road for sure. Yeah, that's, that's great. Thanks. Um, Elena is asking, first she says thanks and then says, I still don't feel like I can now calculate how much ROI I get on $1 invested. She's asking if you could be more precise on the process of how to do that. Well, once again, that it comes back to the KPIs, right? So you, if you're, if sales are your big thing, um, then what you need to do is, and, you know, because one of the, I haven't seen the question here yet, but a lot of the questions that I get are like, hey, when it comes to influencer marketing, um, like how much should, um, A, as an influencer, how much should I charge? And B, a brand will say, how much should I pay them? Mm -hmm. Right. And it really comes down to everything's negotiable. And what you think is a good deal. So if I go to an influencer and I say, hey, um, I really like your content. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's, it fits with my brand. Um, and I want to do five posts with you. And I'm going to do five posts on Instagram and one YouTube video. And I have a budget of, let's say, $2,500. Mm -hmm. And the influencer says, hey, that makes sense. You know, I'm a yoga instructor. You have a yoga product. This, you know, I think this, I don't, I'm not promoting a lot of products. And I would love to do this with you. Then you guys go down that road, right? And so then you can take a look at, like, don't expect that first post that you're going to have tons of money coming in. It's that long, it's that frequency stuff. So let's say at the end of this whole thing, you say, okay, I gave them a unique code. It was, you know, whatever, Joey Yoga, 20% or whatever. So Joey offers that to his audience at 20% off. And then you can go look at your affiliate software and say, okay, did we get anywhere close to the numbers that we wanted at our $2,500 investment, mm -hmm. right? And so if you get $2,000 and you feel like, hey, we've already put some good time into this. Maybe if we did another $2,500, we could push through to $5,000 or $10,000. Um, then that's what you need to take a look at. But you have to figure out in your mind, like, what do you think is a realistic goal with a realistic budget that you have in mind? Mm -hmm. um, if, you know, because that's, that's the problem is you don't know if you've made a dollar because you don't know you and the influencer haven't talked about what would be a win-win, right? Like, what do we consider that? The win is either it's a sales or it's more reach or it's this or it's website visits or whatever that is. Mm -hmm. You have to talk about that ahead of time so you know if you get there. 
Yeah. I think too, you know, it's important to make sure that your, um, your program is mature enough that you're able to use tracking codes. Even if you're not using affiliate software, you can set up different um, tracking parameters for campaigns and then be comfortable measuring that. Because once you know where traffic is coming from, you can um, ideally follow those through to conversions or even apply your conversion rate a little bit more for a little bit less precise um, yeah. measurement. Yeah. You can use it if you don't have affiliate <laughs> software. I mean, there's there's other softwares out there, but you can do you know. I mean, you can use Bitly if that made sense to see if people are driving some traffic there. Um, it once again, it just depends on what you're looking for, and 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 once again, just don't don't read articles in Influencer American and assume that you do one post that it's going to be phenomenal, or that every influencer will work for free, right? That's another thing you got to kind of think about. If you love their content, then they probably have a whole content team. It's not as easy back in the day. It was like, hey, let me just take one little picture and. I you know, put my product, I take a picture, everything's awesome, right? But now it's a different deal. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of the, the amount of time and, and production that people put into these these this, these pieces of content are, there's a whole reason why they caught your eye, right, as a brand. So mm -hmm. it's, you wanna make sure that you're respectful of that time that it takes to be able to put that kind of content together. Yeah, that's great. Um, Kristen's asking, any recommendations about implementing successful influencer marketing in the healthcare pharma space because it's so regulated? So, yeah, so when the, um, you mean like handing out free drugs to kids or something? No, I'm I totally think kidding. that, oh. no. <laughs> I just, no I just don't said. do that, Kristen. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. It's not recommended. That was not recommended. No, um, you know, I think the thing is, is some of the industry, so once again, influencer marketing isn't for everybody in every industry. When you talk about industries that are heavily regulated, um, like when you talk about insurance companies or stuff like that, it becomes a little more difficult or, or if you're advising people on financial advice or offering legal advice or something like that becomes difficult because um, you know you want to be able to put something up there and you want to be able to put something in, you know I think first of all you want to make sure with any influencer you're working with that you review the content before it goes live right so I mean I think that's a that's a step one to make sure there's not potentially any problems there um, but it's it's you really want to like I said review it but I think with the, the heavily regulated industries it becomes a little more difficult or a lot more difficult because everything either a needs to be run by an attorney and then there's just a lot of if you want to have a reaction to something and put it on social media or as an influencer wants to put something that has something to do with your product because something good happens and needs to be reviewed and needs to be, you know, 10 attorneys need to look at it, then it kind of takes away that kind of, I don't know, the it kind of takes away some of the, the sizzle, I guess, on it. So I'm not saying it's impossible. I mean, we've done some, some good stuff or some successful campaigns with people that in some pretty heavily, heavily re, um, regulated industries. Um, it just, it just is another level of complexity. Um, that comes with that once again because you've you've got to figure out how easy it is to be able to put out content. If it becomes extremely difficult and it takes five days to get something approved, then that is what it is. If it's a YouTube video and you're saying, "Hey, we just want to approve this," that that that's okay because it, maybe the, the we're not scheduling this for another month, so then the legal can take a look at it and go, "Hey, this is good. This is that." But that's where you set up that brief, which will be helpful in, in creating that content, right? So, hey, you can't say this. You can't. I can't say. You know, if I'm representing an attorney, I can't say. You know, I'm an attorney. I can't say that I'm advising you. I can't say there's certain things you can't do in certain industries. And if you let the influencer know ahead of time, then they can stick within those parameters and it can help with the approval process as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and Nate is asking, do you recommend offering a percentage of revenue sales versus upfront payment to influencer? So the first question is, do you want to offer them a percentage of the sales from their efforts or upfront payment? And then if you do want to offer a percentage, um, what's the standard percentage for that? Yeah. So, um, so thanks for the question, Nate. So I think the thing is, is it, and once again, everything, there is no standard with every influencer, right? Because every influencer is literally their own business, right? So, um, and that's one thing that we're working on now is some education side of things on influencers, how to like run their business as a business, right? If you're an influencer. So the thing is, is like if the percentage is really whatever your margins are, right? So let's say you have like, let's say, Neil, I think your guys' product is a cleanse, right? So you guys have, it's a service-based thing, right? And maybe you have a, 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 some products that they have to purchase as well. You know, if it's just a, um, a video type product that there's not a heavy cost to you because you already have a fixed cost of it that you've already produced the videos and stuff, then you have more room to work with some type of um, commission there, right? If it is a, a physical product, it's, it's this mouse, right? It's my, my mouse that I've created and it costs me $30 to produce that and I'm selling it for 60, then my margins are gonna be a lot less, right? So I, I obviously can't offer an influencer 50% because then I would be breaking even on that product. 
So it really comes down to whatever you think is a good split, whatever you think is good, and whatever the influencer feels is, is good as well. And these are conversations that you want to have with each in influencer or each individual. You use software to, to look at your list of whatever it is, yoga instructors in Los Angeles as an example. You get that list down, you get it down to 35 people, go look at their content, make sure that it resonates with your brand. And then you're going to ask these types of questions like, hey, um, we're a startup, we're doing this, we're doing that. We've got a budget, we don't have a budget, but here's what we were thinking. I mean, how do you make it a win-win, right? I mean, influencers get pitched all day long, right? I mean, it's if you're a good influencer, you're getting pitched probably 10, 15 times a week, if not more, right? And so you have to figure out how you're gonna break through that. And if you just say, hey, I would like to offer you a free $10 t-shirt for you know 18 posts on your profile, that's not a win-win, right? You have to figure out how it's gonna be a win-win. So in those situations, <clears throat> you say, hey, what we've done in the past is, if you have good successes with another influencer, you say, hey, we worked with Jennifer Smith and we gave her a 25% split and she you know, did five posts and she was able to make you know, $15,000 or $10,000. And then I go, shoot, now me as an influencer, I have a following that's similar to hers and I feel like I could still make that kind of money. So you're dangling that carrot, right? If, if you've had successes like that, then you wanna use that because that will get more people involved um, instead of being that first person that goes and says, well, I'll try the percentage thing because the issue is when you offer somebody a percentage, they think of the last company that they worked with that offered a percentage and they didn't make any money. Mm -hmm. But your product's totally different, right? So you don't you want to compare apples to apples. So why go? So what you want to do is you want to explain to them why this percentage that you're giving and why it's why it's so um, I guess so um, I don't know why it's such a why it's such a good deal for them, mm -hmm. right? Like what's in it for them? They're gonna say, okay, I, I get it. You want to give me twenty five percent, but that's nothing. Well, it's nothing except our average price point of our product is fifteen hundred dollars. And influencers in the past that have posted this much content, we've seen them do at least 10 classes or, you know, sell at least 10 of the courses. So 10 times $1,500 is $15,000 and 25% of that is going to be, you know, $3,500 or whatever that number is, right? So that's where you want to paint the picture for them on why this is a win for them. And that's, you know, but those percentages are really, you have to come up with that percentage and the influencer will tell you whether they think that's a good deal or not. And, and tell them you're open to negotiations as well. Um, some people put percentages ahead of time. Some people don't. Hey, we're open to a percentage type, you know, relationship, but let's talk about it. And I usually will jump on a call with them and, and kind of talk it out a little bit. That's great. Um, yeah. So uh, someone is asking, how do you determine an effective budget for an influencer marketing campaign? So we have that question. And then I think we have, we have two more. <clears throat> yeah. So when it comes to a budget for an influencer marketing campaign, I mean, it's, once again, it, it, it's, that's always a hard one too, because I, I don't mm -hmm. want to say, hey, you know, you know, you can do it for zero dollars because you can. And then, you know, and then I've had people that have, you know, spent $25,000 and it, it wasn't enough. I mean, it really depends on the product and service. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things I think you have to take a look at is, is what, I mean, what, well, first of all, what's realistic budget wise for you, right? So if you have a product that's making good money, influencer marketing should be uh, one of those pieces, one of the tools in the tool shed, right? So it's not, you shouldn't put all of your money into influencer marketing but you should set a budget aside. So let's say you're saying, let's say it's a thousand dollars, then, okay, great. Then that's what you want to do. You want to set that and you want to go find five influencers Then you're looking at a $200 budget and you have to find influencers that are willing to do that. But that's the thing is that you can find those influencers or probably you find the influencers that are what we call micro influencers. So ones that maybe haven't done tons of campaigns, um, ones that are willing to grow with your brand, ones that are willing to, Hey, I haven't been paid for anything yet, but I feel like I have a good following. I'm about to start making some money. So those are the people you want to go find, you know, if you go after an established influencer has been doing this for a long time, um, expect that you have to have a healthy budget. Um, right. So there, there's ways to go and test that. Then there's way there's partnerships as well. I mean, I know people that, you know, that will go to big influencers and this can either be recommended or not recommended, but that have like a t-shirt company or something and saying, Hey, I'll go partner with you. And why don't you, I'll maybe, maybe because they're moving the needle so much with sales that they do some kind of an ownership type thing. It's, Everything's negotiable. That's the thing is it's hard to give one, one answer to just one specific question because there's a lot of moving pieces to it, but your budget is what you can afford. Don't go outside of that. Mm -hmm. And then you just got to go find the people that are willing to work with you, but you have to make it a win-win, right? So you can't, you have to find those people. And, and sometimes it's hard to find those people, but once you do, and somebody that's, you know, growing their business the way that you're growing your business, then you can grow at the same time. Then you can see phenomenal things that could happen. That's great. Um, Anna's asking, what's the best number of days to measure your ROI? Like how long do you wait before you start taking those measurements? Well, I mean, your measurements, you should always set those up ahead of time, right? So you know what they are. 
Mm -hmm. um, and then really, I, I wouldn't take a look in at the ROI. I mean, you can look, you can take a look at the ROI and all that kind of stuff, but I would wait till the end of the campaign, mm -hmm. right? So the idea is, is to set it up, hey, with what it's like I said, you know, five posts, three videos, 10 things on Facebook Live, whatever that is, whatever your package is, then you take a look at the ROI at the end of that um, mm -hmm. and see what brought in the, the most amount of, um, of traction, right? Because the thing is, that's another thing too, is if you have an influencer that has a good, you know, they're good on Facebook and because they're Facebook Live and then they have good stuff on Instagram and, and on YouTube, maybe you diversify a little bit and find out what brought the most, you know, bang for your buck, right? And mm -hmm. you kind of move those things around a little bit. So there is no, once again, no exact answer, but I think what you want to do is you take a look at ROI at the end, but do the frequency thing. Don't just do one post and assume that's going to bring tons of sales because that's, that's pretty unrealistic. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, great. So last question is from Carol, who is asking, how do you know an influencer has engaged followers? Yeah, so that's, I mean, there's software for that, right? So we, we use Grin as an example um, where you can go look at engagement. Um, Social Bakers is another good one. The thing that we do is, we go and you'll actually show an engagement rate. Um, but one thing you have to be careful with an engagement rate is, you know, as I curate this list, once again, I'm a yoga instructor, let's say, or I have a yoga brand in LA. I'm trying to find yoga instructors in Los Angeles. You go and you got this list. There's 2000 in theory influencers. And what we do is we, we you know, we, we get more specific on them. And then what we do is we get that down, whatever, 35, 50, hundred. We go and look at their actual profiles. Mm -hmm. And we want to see what is the most engagement. Engagement, <laughs> be careful. If engagement does not mean, uh, engagement can fool a software of where this person has a 5% engagement rate. That can be emojis. If you have, go to a page and the person has 500 emojis, that's not engagement. And there's something funny going on there because they're just, you, we're looking for engagement. Somebody that says, hey, great post. Hey, I had a question about this. Hey, and also look at their past content as well, right? You want to be able to look at like who, who has engaging content. And if you're uh, what we say, a micro-influencer, somebody that has a good following, but it's not like a Kim K type crazy following, are those people responding to questions? That's another thing. Or, mm -hmm. the or responding to their audience. That's engagement. Like, hey, Shane, I was wondering, like, that's a really cool hat that you wore the other day. Like, where'd you get that? Oh, hey, John, I got that over at uh, mm -hmm. Nordstrom's Com, you know, and that's, this is what it is. Oh, that's really cool. And then somebody else goes, hey, Shane, once again, yeah, that hat was super epic. How much is that hat? Hey, John, it's, it's um, $39.95. They just had it on sale. Whatever the deal is, right? That's engagement. That's people going back and forth emojis of just this kind of stuff, which I'm not saying you can't do an emoji, but if people have tons of emojis and you have to assume that's that, that's not true engagement. There's something funny going on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you, I, you know, if you are using BuzzSumo inside our influencer search tool, we have several different engagement indicators. One is the average yeah. engagement, which is the percentage of someone's tweets that are retweets. Um, yeah. Then you can also check out their reply ratio. That's how often they reply to other people and their retweet ratio. So you want to take a look at how often they're retweeting other people's content. And then once you've gotten that list, like Shane said, kind of narrowed down, you can go into their profiles and see um, other topics they tweet about, as well as the different things, um, the different links that they've tweeted. So it really gives you a nice picture of engagement. Um, we also have there an Instagram engagement indicator uh, that will show you how engaged someone is with their, um, with their audience on Instagram. But I totally agree with Carol that that's, that's really key. You don't want to hire someone um, who is necessarily a, a broadcaster. You want that interaction for most, most things, I would think. Yeah, it's important, very important. Cool. So um, we let's see one more question and then we'll stop. If an influencer had a hundred thousand followers, what is the average percentage for someone who actually sees the post when they have um, a 4% engagement rate? Obviously others have seen it, but not engaged. Yeah. It's a little so, complicated I mean, head math there. <laughs> I know. I was like, wow. They're like, Shane, what is the algorithm of Instagram? I'm like, hmm. So here's the deal. So, I mean, that's, that stuff can be seen on insights, right? Uh, mm -hmm. From an influencer's perspective, they can see who's seen what and, and that kind of thing. I mean, engagement rate of 4% is not bad. A hundred thousand followers is obviously a good amount of followers. You know, we start to see engagement rates go lower as the follower count goes up. Mm -hmm. And the reason why that is, is the analogy I always use is like, so if I open a restaurant today, um, and we have our grand opening it opens at five and I have 150 people that come in in four hours. I could probably go around and shake everybody's hands, right? I call it like, shake hands and kiss babies, right? I can shake. Now, if I, it's another Friday night and this is our grand opening, it's another restaurant and I have 10,000 people come through in four hours, I'm not going to be able to shake hands and kiss babies, right? I can't go and respond. I can't go introduce myself to everybody. So your engagement rate is lower. 
So that first group probably feels like, wow, that guy, the owner was on top of it, man. He came over and talked to all the tables. He was having fun. He had a beer with me, like whatever, right? The second, the second grand opening was like, I didn't even see the owner. Like, where was he? Right. So the engagement rate is going to be lower. It's same thing on Instagram or wherever. When you, when you have somebody that, you know, Kim K, she's not going to be able to respond to all of her messages, right? She has 10,000 or whatever the number is. She's not going to respond to all those. So the engagement rate becomes a lot less, but when we have a micro influencer, if I had 15 comments, I should have responded 15 times and thanked people and told them this, that engagement where you keep people coming back. That's extremely, extremely important. So you know, engagement rate is something to take a look at. It will diminish as you start to get higher numbers with followers. Hmm. Um, and the algorithm obviously depends on the type of content. We know Instagram loves video when they love, you know, Facebook live, they love that, that live type of content. Um, and it's same with Instagram stories. So you'll see a lot of people that are doing those types of things because it opens up the algorithm. What I mean by that is that you can post a picture and you can have out of a hundred thousand, let's say, I don't know, 50,000 C or 30,000 C. But once you do video, you'll see that your engagement and their likes and all that kind of stuff because they open up the algorithm because they like that content. They see higher engagement on that type of content. So video is, is really the way to go as well. Great. Well, Shane, thank you so very much for your time today. Really super to, uh, to get to hear from you and learn a lot from you about how you track and measure the ROI of your influencer marketing. So thanks so much for being with us. Appreciate your time and uh, have a great day, everyone. You'll get a link to the recording of the session in just about 24 hours. Thanks, Shane. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.